Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar, Food for Thought, Parkinson's Nutrition and Culinary Medicine. I'm Donna Greening, Parkinson Canada's Education Coordinator. To begin, from coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of Inuit, Métis, and First Nations peoples. We're always grateful for our expert speakers who join us to share their knowledge during the webinars. If you have questions about today's topic after the conclusion of the webinar, please contact your healthcare provider or Parkinson Canada's information and referral team. <clears throat> to access closed captioning, you can click on the captions button at the bottom of your screen and then click on show subtitle. Thank you to everyone who pre-submitted questions with your registration. Since today's session is jam-packed, pun intended, the Q&A window is not active for today's event. Dr. Prezant was sent the questions that were submitted with your registrations and will answer as many as possible during the course of our presentation. As always, feel free to use the chat window to say hello or talk amongst yourselves. As with all of our webinars, the resources and links mentioned today will be shared with you in an email, so there's absolutely no need to take any notes. And now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Aaron Prezant, a board certified neurologist fellowship trained movement disorder specialist and certified culinary medicine specialist whose practice in both academic medicine and private practice settings. In 2021, she started Medicine of Yum, a venture devoted entirely to culinary medicine. Through culinary medicine, Dr. Prezan empowers people to make healthy choices with their food and provides tools on how to be healthier in their own kitchens. Medicine of Yum brings evidence-based medical, dietary, and nutrition guidance to people through virtual teaching kitchens. Her favorite part of the teaching kitchens is seeing the dynamics change that happen for people when they are learning and doing for themselves in their own kitchens. Dr. Prezant still remains active in the Parkinson's community, giving talks, writing for neurology publications, and working individually with people with Parkinson's on diet in relation to medications and other symptoms. Welcome, Dr. Prezant. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Um, as you mentioned, this is one of my favorite things to be doing. So um, we'll just jump right in because we do kind of have a jam-packed session here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so I can do a, a little bit of a talk first. Um, and give you guys some background information and um, update you on what is going on in the world of nutrition and Parkinson's. Um, all right, so I think one of the main questions we start with is why would my diet even matter to my brain? I mean, there's so much information out there like, oh, okay, what I eat matters to my cardiovascular system or it may give me diabetes or this or that, but we don't see that much on how it affects our brain. So a consistently poor diet, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, um, can lead to an increase in inflammation throughout your body, leading to this kind of chronic inflammatory state that you might have. Then other things that contribute to this inflammatory state may be stress and poor sleep and depression. And, and those are factors that we may not have as much control over, especially with a, a chronic disease like Parkinson's. So we want to take control of what we can. Um, our systems produce these inflammatory factors that damage many different organs in our bodies, and the brain is one of those organs that can be damaged and is susceptible to that. So some studies have shown that patients um, with Parkinson's uh, in, in their gastrointestinal systems, they showed an increased inflammatory factors. So this leads us to the question, questions, um, could the GI inflammation play a part in the development of PD? Could the changes in the gut microbiota lead to inflammation we see in the, um, in the guts in people with Parkinson's? But you may be asking, what is that gut microbiota? What does that mean? You may hear it all the time. It's kind of a catchphrase now. Um, so we've got the good bugs, the bad bugs, and the gut bugs. And really, our gut bugs are the good bugs. <laughs> our gut has about a 100 trillion bacteria, about a third is the same amongst the population, and then two thirds is unique to each individual. So no two people have the same microbiome going on in their guts. Um, we know that a diverse and balanced gut microbiome 
plays a role in the overall health of, of the host or of us. So what, what does the microbiome do? It uh, wards off harmful microorganisms, regulates immunity, and produces substances that are helpful to the body. So there have been some studies to suggest that there are differences in the microbiomes of people with Parkinson's versus people without Parkinson's. But just so we're clear, to date, there's no data that suggests that um, these differences is the cause of Parkinson's. We don't know exactly what it means. It's just an interesting tidbit that's out there. We do know that uh, the gut and the brain communicate, though, and we call that the gut-brain axis. So this is another thing that you're, you may be seeing out there um, in the research world. Um, there's a two-way communication. So we don't know necessarily um, which way the signals are being sent when somebody has Parkinson's. Um, so there are abnormal proteins in the brains of people with Parkinson's. They're known as Lewy bodies which you've probably heard of. And those are also found in the gut of the majority of people with Parkinson's. So did these abnormal proteins start in the gut and then make their way to the brain or vice versa? Or is there some other mechanism involved? These are all things that are still out there and needing to be researched. But we do know that what happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut and that the gut biome has an impact on our central nervous system. So um, there's mounting evidence, like I said, and we're still waiting for clearer information on how this research will play out and how we'll be able to apply it in a clinical setting. The hope is that the no more we know about the gut biome and how it relates to Parkinson's disease may actually help us to diagnose Parkinson's disease earlier or maybe come up with new therapies and help the symptoms in order to improve, improve quality of life. So these are all things that are exciting and hoping to, we're hoping to see more information on hopefully soon. All right. And now that I've gone over that, you may be sitting there thinking, okay, well, great. Now you haven't given me anything practical that I can do. <laughs> and you may be feeling like a little bit like you need some help. I understand. So eating with Parkinson's, you know, you're trying to figure out what to eat and you're already dealing with all of these other Parkinson's symptoms motor and non-motor. So the non-motor ones, difficulty smelling, difficulty swallowing, maybe apathy and depression is really impacting the food that you can get or put into your body, a lack of appetite and weight loss, constipation, and then the motor symptoms like, you know, feeling stiff and you can't stand or, or you're worried about falling in the kitchen. So I understand that following a specific diet and adding this into the mix with Parkinson's might seem like too much. So let's try to break it down and make it a little simpler. First, the one question everybody asks, is there a Parkinson's disease diet? And the short answer is no. So we could just end the talk here and move on. However, there have been studies that have shown that a Mediterranean type of diet is kind of healthiest for overall mortality, meaning like our whole body. And more recent studies have shown that um, for the brain, a Mediterranean and mind type of diet may be best for people with symptoms um, of, of Parkinson's disease or already diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So what are these two diets? Unfortunately, they overlap quite a bit. So let me just go ahead and go through this. I love this, um, this kind of a graphic of the Mediterranean diet pyramid in the United States, you know, as kids, like in the 80s, 90s, we had this food pyramid and it didn't look anything like this. You know, it was like on the bottom, meat and cheese and dairy. And um, as we went up, all these other things that are, are good for our bodies got less and less. So this is a, a kind of revamped um, diet pyramid. And I love how on the bottom part, the base of the pyramid talks about being physically active and enjoying meals with others. This is something that I think we don't associate with our nutrition, but it really should be associated with our nutrition because the more we enjoy meals with others um, and are physically active after we eat, um, the better we do, people with and without Parkinson's. But we do know that isolation and Parkinson's increases, apathy increases, um, symptoms and decreases quality of life. So this is an important base to have on the food pyramid. 
Now getting to the food part, we want the food base to be mainly vegetables and fruits, whole grains, beans, nuts, legumes, and then like fresh herbs and spices. So these are all the like whole foods, these beautifully colored foods that we can find in the grocery store. And it doesn't matter what they are. So when I say Mediterranean diet, it doesn't mean it has to be chickpeas and um, other foods that you find in, in the Mediterranean region. If that is not what's right for you, that's okay. Every culture around the world has their own um, whole grain, has their own fruits, has their own dark leafy greens. And you can find them um, where you live, no matter what, where, where you are. All right. And then there's fish and seafood in the United States. We don't do a very good job of eating enough fish and seafood. Um, it may be different in Canada and it doesn't matter what the, the fish and seafood is. So if you have access to freshwater fish, that's okay. If you have access to salmon, that's great. Um, you know, the, the two that I say to stay away from are like shark, and swordfish tend to have higher levels of mercury, but you know, I really don't like people getting caught up on the, those little, little details. Um, and then next is poultry or, or lower um, fat meats, eggs, cheese, and yogurt. And at the very top of the pyramid, we have meats and sweets. So we wanna limit those as much as we can. There were a few questions about alcohol and Parkinson's. Um, to date, we don't. I don't have any real studies that show one way or another with alcohol and Parkinson's. We do know that um, obviously alcohol can uh, affect your gait, can make you less stable. So you do definitely want to be careful about that if you're drinking um, any alcohol with Parkinson's. Also, we do know in terms of cancer risk and other other parts of our body, alcohol has pretty much um, been shown to be detrimental. So, you know, I'm going to kind of like push the alcohol um, to the side and say, if you don't drink, I wouldn't start drinking. If you do everything in moderation and make sure you're talking with your doctor about that too, okay? Um, the alcohol topic is is complicated and maybe a little too complicated for today the mind diet so it's a little um it, it tells us more of what to limit so really it's very much like the mediterranean diet you want those whole grains vegetables it does have wine on there so like i said you know it's kind of um the the data is all, kind of all over the place there in terms of alcohol um leafy green vegetables so that can include but uh, it's not limited to spinach, bok choy, uh, kale, um, even romaine lettuce counts. So whatever your dark leafy green um, is of choice, eat it. Nuts, beans, poultry berries. So on the mind diet, you'll notice only fruit they mention is berries. Um, those have been shown to have higher antioxidants. Um, and uh, But if you don't have access to berries, other fruit is okay too. Fish. And then you really want to be limiting the butter and margarine, limiting pastries and sweets, limiting red meat, and limiting um, cheese and fast foods. This is just another way of visualizing all of this. I like this because um, half of our plate should really be vegetables and fruits, if not more. And then we have the, our whole grains. And the whole, you know, we at least in the United States, we used to have like half of our plate or three quarters of our plate filled up with a protein, which was usually red meat or something like that. And now we really want that, the, the protein portion to be about a quarter of the plate. And it doesn't have to be this huge piece of meat. There are so many other options. So this is just another visual, which I, I find to be good. So getting back to Parkinson's disease specifically, a study published in 2022 showed an association between higher flavonoid consumption and better survival rates in people with Parkinson's. So what are flavonoids? They are powerful antioxidants that help to fight inflammation. They may have a protective effect on the brain. That is what the theory is as to why, why you know, they're good for our brain. So in this study, they specifically used berries, oranges, tea, I believe it was black tea in that study, apples, and red wine. So I just want to clarify that study doesn't mean that if you eat berries and oranges and apples, 
and drink red wine, you won't get Parkinson's. It was just saying that there was an association between um, eat a higher diet filled with flavonoids, a diet higher <laughs> that was filled with flavonoids more and um, longer survival rates in people with Parkinson's. This is not one-to-one. -one. Dietary studies are very difficult. You know, it's not like if you eat raspberries, you will live till you're 95. It doesn't quite work that way. It's a little harder to make these, uh, um, these conclusions in nutrition studies, especially with the brain. So these are all associations. Keep that in mind. So when we're talking about ways to eat healthier, I like people, while we call it a Mediterranean diet, I like people to think of it more as a way of life, right? So an established eating pattern rather than a diet. A diet implies something we do for a certain amount of time, then stop. So I need to lose 20 pounds, I'm gonna go on a diet, right? This is the old diet culture that was so popular in the 80s, 90s, <clears throat> even probably some now too. There are all these different diets out there, gluten-free, intermittent fasting, keto, paleo, all of these things, right? For the most part, those diets are very, very difficult to hold up. And that's why people do them for a certain amount of time and then stop. They're so restrictive and so difficult that people don't stick to them. And I like people to change slowly, incorporating these things into their way of life so that it can be a routine and it can be something that you do for the long haul, all right? So we start with recognizing what we are doing well and giving ourselves a pat on that and letting go of the guilt. So another problem with these really strict diets is I'm on a keto diet, oh no, I ate too many carbs. And then what does our brain do? Our brain says, oh, I failed and it shuts down and stops doing it. All right, we lose our motivation and it becomes too hard to kind of like stay on that, on that track. So with a way of uh, an eating pattern and a way of life, it's like, oh, it's Sunday, I'm going to a birthday party. I can have that piece of cake because I know that most of the time I'm doing what's right for my body, right? And we don't need to hold on to that guilt and, and turn ourselves into um, failures in our, in our mind. All right, shifting a little bit, because this is a very common question specific to Parkinson's, um, is the protein question. And we have questions about protein in part because with a chronic disease like Parkinson's, you may struggle with unintentional weight loss, muscle loss. And as we age, everyone undergoes a normal process of losing muscle mass. So making sure you're getting nutrient-dense protein is important. Um, but as I saw in many of the questions, maybe it's interacting with your Parkinson's medication with the carbidobolivodopa. And if it's taken at the same time, you may notice a significant difference in how well your medications work. So what does that mean? That means you take your dose of carbidobolivodopa one day and you're moving well and the next day it doesn't work at all and you don't know why or the next dose it doesn't work well. It could be because of this interaction with protein. So what happens is the, the protein and the, the medication bind to the same receptor in the gut. So if you've eaten protein, those receptors are already filled up and you can't absorb it. So not everyone experiences this interaction. So if you don't, you don't, don't worry about it. But if you are, there are a couple mechanisms you can try um, that could help. So you wanna try to separate your protein consumption from when you take your medications. If you're taking medications really frequently, like every two hours, every hour, every three hours, it could be really difficult. And I understand that. It's definitely not easy and it can take a little bit of maneuvering. So you want to, you could try considering eating a higher protein meal at the end of the day that we call that a protein redistribution um, diet. So that means during the day, you're not eating as much high protein when you're taking your medication, then towards the end of the day, when maybe you need less um, motor movement, you're not moving around as much, you're not out doing stuff, you can eat a higher protein meal. And even if the medications don't work quite as well, you might do okay. You can consider eating smaller meals and snacks, so you're not getting as much protein at one sitting. And if you do need to eat something with your medications, try eating something that's really lower in protein, a, a piece of whole grain bread that's plain or with jam on it or something, 
not with peanut butter or other um, protein filled toppings, pre-cut vegetables or fruit would work as well. So, you know, it can take a little bit of time to figure out what works for you. And I know, I understand that that's not easy, but it is something that is important to try. And obviously you want your medications to be working. So what are nutrient source, uh, dense sources of protein? So um, lower in saturated fat meats like poultry, obviously fish, eggs, the nuts, um, and whole grain cereals like oats, um, those types of things are good uh, sources of protein. Remember that plants do have protein as well, and there are ones that are higher in protein than others. Um, so if you are vegan or vegetarian based, you can easily get enough protein. On here, this this doesn't have, um, well, it has edamame, but like tofu is very high in protein. Um, so you can definitely find protein sources in plants. Another really important aspect I feel to people with Parkinson's is fiber. So in general, people don't get enough fiber. Adults in kind of the Western culture don't eat enough fiber. And, but by incorporating the principles of the MIND diet and Mediterranean diet, you will naturally increase your fiber intake. So why is that? Because if you're increasing your whole grains, those have fiber. If you're increasing your vegetable intake, those have fiber. If you're increasing your fruits, you want to eat the fruits with the skin on. So if you're having an apple, don't peel it first. Um, you know, eating the skin provides a lot of good fiber for your gut. And then increasing your legumes too. In the United States, again, we don't eat a lot of legumes. A lot of people don't eat enough beans and things. And those have been one of the, the groups of foods that have been found to uh, be consumed in people who live longer and um, and one of the healthier brain foods for, for us in general. So also in addition to being good for your brain, in Parkinson's increasing fiber can be helpful for the constipation, the non-motor symptom that the majority of people with Parkinson's experience. Fiber is a natural probiotic for these gut microbiota um, and really make them happy. So with a probiotic, a probiotic is the fiber that goes into our gut that then those little bugs in our gut feed on. So it makes them really, really happy and increases that diversity in our gut, which is what we're looking for. All right, so this is our happy gut with the broccoli and the apple with the skin on. Um, so you want you want your gut to look like that, <laughs> kind of. Um, so a lot of questions around dairy. This is another PD specific um, question. And it's a good question. So there have been investigations um, in relation to Parkinson's and dairy, and there's mounting evidence that a, a diet high in dairy may increase the risk of Parkinson's. So again, this isn't, uh, you know, I drank a glass of milk every day for 20 years, so I'm going to get Parkinson's. It's not a one-to-one -one like that, okay? So it's, it's an association and it may increase the risk. Um, another study showed that there may be an association with a rapid rate of, uh, faster rate of progression in people with early, um, and mild Parkinson's with a, a diet higher in dairy. In addition, talking about the, the non-motor symptoms of, um, Parkinson's again, dairy can increase constipation, especially cheese. Now cheese is one of the harder things for people to usually take out of their diet in Western culture. And, um, but it's something to, to kind of consider, especially if you're really struggling with that, that constipation. Reducing dairy and increasing fiber can be really that component to help with the constipation. So I think that a lot of times focusing on what you can increase rather than what you can pull out of your diet is helpful. So if we tell our brains, I can't eat that, immediately, what do you want to do? You want to go eat what you just told yourself you can't eat. So focusing on increasing the fiber um, will actually sometimes help to reduce these other things that, that you don't want to be eating quite as much. So if we're increasing our fiber in our diet, we'll feel fuller. And so we may not want to snack on um, all those processed foods or the sweet foods um, that we we tend to go towards when we're not feeling so full. Um, 
So both the Mediterranean kind of diet and mine diet limit dairy as well. So are we back to this? Are you guys thinking, oh, okay. So you give me all this information. Now I have to do all this stuff and, and I don't even know how to do it. I can't, I can't do it. And then our brains automatically go to, I give up. All right. I get it. So starting slow is important. Giving yourself some grace, like I talked about before and, um, really letting go of that guilt. If you, um, are having a hard time sticking to certain things, you know, you go at a slow pace and make it something you can do regularly. So easy recipes, easy doesn't mean they taste bad. Okay. I think that that's really important to make sure people know, um, you know, crock pot recipes, instant pot recipes, they're really good flavorful recipes out there that don't take very much prep soups, casseroles. Again, these don't have to be like um, kind of like just brown, gross soups and casseroles that don't have any flavor. These can have a lot of flavor and with very little work. Frittatas, roasted vegetables, smoothies, which can be a good place to start introducing like plant-based milks. Um, so in my house, we use macadamia nut milk most of the time, just because that's what we found most of us like there's no one that's better than the other i would watch out for um sweetened plant-based milks so soy milks and other um flavored vanilla flavored plant-based milks oftentimes have a high amount of sugar in them so you really you want to get those unsweetened um plant-based milks if you're going to use those overnight oats so you have something in the fridge um when you get up in the morning if you're not feeling well. So all of these things um, you can do quickly and make, and they can be, they can also taste good. So food prep is a huge, huge component to this. And it's just something you kind of have to get used to, right? Um, and figure out the timing on when it's good for you. So buying pre-cut vegetables in your grocery store, if um, you know the cost is not prohibitive for you, could be a good option if you're having a hard time cutting. Okay. Keep in mind, chopping can be done while sitting. If I'm chopping a bunch, I often can sit at my table um, because, you know, standing up for that long can sometimes hurt your back, your legs. I, there are all these different things. We don't want you to fall with a knife using a food processor. So if you're not making a big meal for a bunch of people, uh, you might think, oh, the food processor is just too much. They make very small little ones that you can food process, not very much food in, easy to clean. Um, I love grinding up vegetables to put into sauces and things like that. I have two younger kids who are in their little like very picky phases. So I'm always hiding vegetables and things in in sauces and, and other things that they're eating. Um, they, they're this kind of chopper. I have this here. Um, you just open it up, you put the food in there and push down. If this could be good too, useful. Um, and it could be a way that you could actually work on some strength <laughs> or somebody else in your family could help you do it too if, if you need. So that's always a good option. So there are tools out there. You can get the whole family involved. So if you live with other people, help get them involved too. And it might make the prep a little bit less tedious. Very, very important in Parkinson's is make sure you're prepping food when you feel your medications are working. So if you're like, I need to prep food and it's 10 o'clock on a Sunday and you don't feel well, don't, don't try to do it that, you know, if there's a time of day, you, feel, you know, you feel worse, don't try to prep then. Oftentimes the afternoon, you know, three, four, 5 PM is difficult for a lot of people. That's why having the food already prepped and in your fridge is good because then you know, when you're hungry in the evening, you can go to the fridge, you can say, oh, it's there, pop it in the oven, the, the microwave, wherever, and have something good um, to eat. So I love having food ready in the fridge or freezer, like I said. Um, and when that apathy kicks in, that way you don't, you're not reaching for the box of processed food that um, that's not as good for your body. You can always make it easier with these substitutions. So if you really can't chop food, frozen vegetables are just fine. Um, or if you don't live somewhere where you can get like good frozen vegetables the whole year round, frozen vegetables are fine. I always keep frozen vegetables on hand because sometimes I'm like, ah, I don't have anything else. So we're going to have that tonight. 
fresh vegetables. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, like I said, I have two small kids. They don't like cooked vegetables right now. Um, so I always have chopped carrots, bell peppers, cucumbers, because this is what they'll eat. And so every night on the table, that's what I put out. Just a plate of, of fresh vegetables chopped. It doesn't have to be fancy, but that's how they'll eat their vegetables. So if that's how you eat them, great, do that. You want to be careful about canned vegetables packaged in um, a high sodium solution. Um, you can always freeze fresh veggies or prepare them into sauces. If you're feeling like you can do that, like pestos or soups. Again, fresh fruit with the skin um, is great. Frozen fruits are fine too. If you can't find those berries in February, get frozen berries and you put them in a smoothie, you can put them on top of your oatmeal. There are a lot of things to do. You can buy fruit in jars and cans as well, but just make sure it's not in that really thick um, sugary syrup. Um, you can always puree the fruits um, and freeze to use at a later date. Um, dried fruits are fine too and could really help with constipation. Just watch for a lot of added sugars and preservatives. Um, I know, you know, dr dried fruits with added sulfite give me really bad uh, migraines. So I have to be careful about that. So just pay attention to those things. Fresh herbs for um, flavor are really helpful. And this can be great for somebody with a little bit of... Um, difficulty tasting or smelling. The, the fresh herbs can be pretty, but also you, you might be able to taste those better. So when you're at the store, where you think about where you can get a whole grain, um, what kind of bread are you buying? You wanna make sure that it says whole grain um, wheat, not just wheat bread. So wheat bread um, is not a source of a whole grain. You want it to say whole grain wheat, um, whole wheat. Sorry, uh, buy bread maybe with seeds and nuts added to them if you can um, eat that without choking. Corn tortillas are better than flour tortillas as corn's a whole grain. And you, again, you wanna limit those processed foods and when possible, substitute in whole foods. So reuse and batch cook. This is super important. Think about ways a dinner that you make tonight can be turned into breakfast or lunch for the next day. So last night I roasted some vegetables and I'll show you later when I'm doing the bowl that I'm gonna turn that into lunch today. I could have even had that, turned it into breakfast this morning with eggs, but I, I didn't do that. But you can always do that. I love adding um, those fresh cut veggies that I always have in my fridge to an omelet or to scrambled eggs in the morning. Make sure you're cooking larger portions of grains and proteins. So if you have whole wheat pasta, quinoa, brown rice, all that stuff can be kept in your fridge and reheated for later. Um, quinoa, which I'm gonna be using in the bowl later, I make big batches of it and freeze it in individual bags um, once it's cooked. And it can be just popped out of the freezer, put in a microwave and um, defrosted. And there you go, you have quinoa ready. Freeze soups, sauces, and casseroles. So this is one of my favorite um, favorite things because it has um, on the inside here it has one cup and half cup, and you can portion it out. So let's say you're just cooking for yourself or just cooking for two people. Um, you don't want to make a huge batch of soup, but you can do that and freeze it here. I freeze chili, I freeze soups, I freeze sauces. Um, you can make eggs, uh, egg casseroles and things like that and freeze them. So you don't have to make every meal from scratch at that moment, right? So these are just things that I'm always like thinking about, like did how many vegetables did I have? If you have those veggies prepped, um, then you go to your fridge, you grab them, you're eating. You're eating them. You don't even have to have a second thought about them. Did you eat a fruit today? If not, then grab whatever fruit you like. You know, a whole apple. I always have apples. I love apples. That's one of my go-tos. Berries. Um, I live in California, so we do have berries most of the time. But if you don't, then, then um, you know, there are other ways, other fruits you can have. Whole grains. Um, and is there something processed that you could substitute with a whole fresh food? So these are ways to get started on, on kind of moving towards that way of life that you can make it sustainable and something you can keep up, okay? Now I understand with Parkinson's, 
again, you're dealing with so many different things. Um, one hypotension. So if your blood pressure is dropping or you're getting lightheaded, first of all, make sure you're discussing this with your doctor. Like this is very important and needs to be taken care of, but you don't need to worry about so much about sodium in your diet. Right. So, um, we know for cardiovascular health, we don't want to eat too much sodium, but if you're getting dizzy like this, you may actually need that sodium. So eat salted nuts rather than unsalted, um, nuts, but don't add sodium by eating ultra processed food. So don't think, oh, well, I need the sodium. So I'm going to have this bag of Doritos. That's not where you want to get the sodium. Add a little bit more salt to your, to your food that you've made, or again, the nuts, things like that. If you have a decreased sense of smell, this can affect your taste too. And it may lead to apathy in the kitchen, which I understand. So trying new textures on your food, um, by using nuts or seeds to provide a crunch, experiment with spices. Sometimes there are spices that you might taste better than other spices. And remember that we eat with our eyes too. So whatever you're making, make it colorful. These, I will show you, This I keep these because I like crunchy stuff on my food. Um, I'm a big, like I love chips, croutons, anything like that. So I try to keep them out of my house so I don't eat them. And these are um, lentils that I cooked. And then I put on a baking sheet in my oven with some seasoning and crisp up. So now I just throw these on top of my salad or whatever I'm eating and I get that crunchy goodness that I kind of crave. So if you're having dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, again, this is a super important thing to discuss with your doctor and get a formal swallow evaluation. Um, it's important to know what you can and cannot eat because a lot of people assume, well, if I'm having trouble swallowing, I have to have purees only. That's not necessarily true. And there are so many good foods out there that you can probably eat, um, but you need that formal swallow evaluation. So remember, you can turn a lot of these foods into different textures, um, depending on what, what's right for you. So like I said, perfection, we're not looking for everyday perfection is not the goal because none of us are perfect. And even if you're following paleo, keto, any of these other diets, you're never going to be 100% perfect. And our brains, if we set ourselves up for failure, then that's where we'll go. So we don't want to do that. We want to set ourselves up for success and for feeling better. Um, so the takeaways really are, well, there's no specific PD diet. The mounting evidence is really pointing to following a Mediterranean mind type of diet and a lifestyle meaning we, um, you know, social connections and exercise too, where a more plant-based whole food um, diet with healthy fats are consumed. And that's just better for your gut biome. So it's going to be better for your whole body. Focus, like I said earlier, focus on increasing those good foods and gradually you'll notice those other foods to fall out of your diet. I recommend that people try to decrease dairy, increase the fiber, and increase those bright colored fruits and vegetables. So again, there's no one fruit or vegetable that I'm like, you have to increase this. If you can't get your hands on that, or you don't like that, or you have an allergy to that, do what is right for you. But the more colorful our food is, the more of those vitamins and nutrients and antioxidants we're consuming. Um, it's, there were a lot of questions about supplements, and I'm going to say this. It's always better to get your nutrients through your food rather than through supplements, okay? And in the Parkinson's disease research, there really hasn't been any supplement that's pointed to being um, helpful in Parkinson's right now. So, you know, if you don't like fish um, and you, you, you know, find other ways to maybe get those omega-3 fatty acids, walnuts are high in omega-3 fatty acids, um, you, can, you can find other ways to do that. If you really are not getting enough, um, you know, you're unable to eat, that might be a place for supplements, but that would be a time to talk to your doctor about, about that or see a nutritionist if you're able to, um, if you're really not able to get the food in. Um, again, make the food your own through flavors that taste good to you. You know, wherever you are from, whatever food is available to you, um, you can make it taste good and be healthy. Do your best to take those baby steps, right? Like it said, we don't want to jump into a diet that restricts you so much that you're unable to keep it up. The baby steps are what makes it sustainable for you. Incorporate the mindfulness. So when you sit down to eat, 
take away phones, sit down at the table, you know, all of those things and try to sit down with other people. Or if you don't live with other people or have other people around, can you get somebody on Zoom? Can you have friends that way? Um, also try to incorporate movement into your life. Hopefully you're doing that, which we know is also very, very helpful with Parkinson's. Always check with your do doctor before making huge dietary shifts too, because you need to know what's right for your body. Everybody has a little bit different situations going on. So it's important to um, address those things. So again, I will say it, a small change is still a change and you need to give yourself a pat on the back for those things. So if you ate more vegetables this week than last week, that's awesome. And it's really never too little or too late. That is the one thing in all the brain research that we see is that no matter when you make the change, it still is good for your brain. So, you know, if you think, oh, I'm too old to make this change. No, it will make a difference. You know, with our brain, it's kind of a long, it's the long con, I like to say, you know, because it's something we have to do for a long time to make a difference. Um, and we can, we can all make those baby steps and it will make a difference. This is just the brain health guide that I helped to write with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. It has a lot of information in there. You can get that at the Michael J. Fox website. This is my information. If you have questions or I wasn't able to address your specific question, you would like to email me, I'd be happy to um, answer your email. My email is there at the bottom and that's the website that you can get me out of there. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And um, now I am, I don't know, can you guys all, uh, hopefully everybody can see me. I'm going to go ahead and make, um, so kind of run through this really quick. I didn't want to choose a recipe that was specific to like very specific ingredients because again, like we all have different things we have, um, we have available to us and we have different tastes, right? So what I love are kind of these bowls where you can throw everything together. I'm a big fan of like, just like dump stuff in a bowl and mix it together and it tastes good and it's good for me. So as I said earlier, um, I make small batches or I huge batches of quinoa and then freeze it in smaller batches. My husband doesn't like quinoa, so I like it. So I make it like this. And this was in a baggie, like right before we started, I threw it in the microwave for I don't know, 40 seconds and stir frosted and good quinoa. So I have that. So I'm going to use that as my base. Okay. So that's a grain, a whole grain that I have going on. It has some protein in it too. Now, um, with kind of these savory bowls, so lunch or dinner um, bowls, you can make something like this for breakfast and put eggs on it. But I'm going to um, go uh, kind of for lunch because it's lunchtime where I am. I, I like to add in my dark leafy greens. So I'm a big kale fan. I know a lot of people hate kale. If you don't like kale, don't eat it. Um, I buy this kale that's already pre-shredded and it makes it a little bit easier for me. That being said, I also buy like the big leaves of kale and I like to massage the kale with some olive oil. So you just pour some olive oil on there and kind of like massage it through your fingers and it kind of breaks that kale down a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna put some kale in my bowl with the quinoa. All right. And I'll just go ahead and mix that up. So I have kale and quinoa in there. Um, yesterday I made some lentils. Okay, so this is just my plain lentils that I'm also gonna put in there for a little more protein because I'm making this plant-based. Now you could throw some salmon or, or chicken from the night before on there if that's what you wanted. All of these things I pre-made and I have it in my fridge so I can throw them together. So other veggies that I have, um, roasted veggies from last night's dinner. These are, this is broccoli and onions. Okay, I just threw these in my oven with some olive oil, a little bit of salt and pepper. I didn't season any of these things too much because I like to keep them pretty um, mildly seasoned when I first make them. So that when I'm making, putting them all together, um, then I can kind of season it the way I'm feeling that day. All right. So I have my broccoli, kale, quinoa. Um, we eat with our eyes, right? So I always like to put some something colorful. So I had some yellow bell pepper that I'm going to throw in there. I also roasted some beets. So 
you know, that's uh, red. I like having all my different colors in there, eating the rainbow. Um, I think my kids ate all of my carrots, so I don't have any carrots for today, but that's okay. I'm getting my red, my orange, um, I have my grain, I have my lentils. It's looking really good there. Um, you could also do things like, you know, canned artichoke hearts, canned vegetables could work for this too. Again, just make sure they're not sitting in a bunch of sodium. So I'm kind of making this more Mediterranean flavors just because that's what I'm doing today. A lot of times I like making kind of an Asian flavor with a soy based or peanut soy based um, sauce dressing. I'm gonna put some olives on there, which are my favorite. So you can buy the pitted olives, um, making sure that you don't have to uh, get those pits out. And then um, I wanna keep my sodium levels low, but you want a little bit of something in there that's maybe creamy or a little bit of salty. So I use vegan um, feta. I am not completely vegan, but I do um, not feel well if I eat a lot of cheese, which is one of my favorite foods, I will admit. So I only eat cheese, regular cheese on kind of holidays and, and special occasions, or if there's really special cheese. Um, and this, I found this vegan cheese in something like this, vegan feta to be really great. Again, if you um, eat regular cheese or you like the regular feta, a little bit of it on top of your bowl is going to be okay. All right. I don't want you thinking you can't have that at all. Let me just wipe my hand off there. All right. This is, these are just the choices that I've made for today. Now we can throw some nuts on top of that. Other options for the grains. Um, you know, there are so many different options for pastas out there now. So you want to try, you can use whole wheat pasta. This one is made from um, quinoa and corn, so it's gluten-free if you are gluten-free. Again, in Parkinson's, there's no evidence for a gluten-free diet being necessary. That being said, I always tell people, if you are gluten-free and you feel better being gluten-free, then, then, you know, far be it from me to tell you that you don't feel better. Uh, Nutritional yeast is also another way to add some like B vitamins and um, flavor if you're a vegan. And I do use that quite a bit. Um, bulgur wheat is another one. Now this isn't gluten-free, but buckwheat is another one that you can use. And that is gluten-free. Despite the name of being buckwheat, it is actually a, a gluten-free um, grain. All right, so lots, lots and lots of options. If you don't like quinoa, you don't like lentils, you know all of these things. So. I also, I'm gonna put a few almonds on here. Now my almonds are unsalted, but if you like, again, if you have those blood pressure issues or you need some extra sodium in your diet, then you can always buy the salted nuts. So this is looking really beautiful and making me wanna eat it, right? So this is important. I love all the colors and I look at it and I think, yeah, I wanna eat that. So I'm gonna just show you really quickly a dressing so you can make your dressing your own. One of the places we get a lot of unwanted sugars and unwanted fats are in bottled um, salad dressings. So I always try to make my own if I can, or I just use olive oil and some balsamic vinegar if I don't have time to make my own dressing. So in here, I already put this in here because I wasn't sure how much time I'd have, but three tablespoons of olive oil and one-ish, maybe a little bit more tablespoon of lemon juice. So I like my dressings a little tart. Um, if you like them a little sweeter, you can use a little less of the lemon juice or vinegar. Those are the two things that you can use in there. So I'm also going to put a little pepper into my jar here. And the spice that I've chose or spices I've chosen, I'm going to put a little dill because I think it's going to go well with the flavors I have in my bowl. Now, if you hate dill, don't use this, but this is some place that if you have trouble tasting, you can try spicy, you can try less spicy. All of those things are options um, and try different flavors that you might like in your dressing. And put a little salt. And oftentimes we do have something sweet in our dressing. Now I don't like my dressing too sweet. So I'm just gonna put a really small squeeze of honey in there. Okay, you can use honey, you can use maple syrup. Um, any of those things would be fine. Um, other options, so I have olive oil, lemon, dill, salt, pepper, 
and just a touch of honey. And then I shake it up in this jar. Now you can make a big batch of dressing for the week if you want and leave it in your fridge. Um, other ways you can incorporate healthy fats into a dressing using um, peanut butter or um, I love tahini. That's one of my favorites. I usually make it with some tahini. Um, if you are struggling with weight loss, tahini is great because it's a, um, it's a, it's high in fat, but it's good fat for you. So, um, I love using tahini, um, or other nut butters. Um, you can use olive oil then, um, you could also use, um, a, a, just a touch of sugar and some soy sauce or something like that if you if you want. So as you can see, the majority of this is um, vegetables, healthy grains. I've got a little bit of um, healthy fats on there with the nuts and the vegan um, feta that I like to use um, and my dressing here, which again is very uh, mild and I don't have too much stuff in there. So it doesn't have all the other stuff that you get from the grocery stores. And I'm just gonna pour it on there um, just to give it a little bit of more flavor and um, and texture. All right, so, you know, you again, you can incorporate anything you want into a bowl like this. I think it's good. Um, you know, the, I see a lot, Sorry, I'm, I just see in the chat a lot about sugar. And I agree, like we want to limit sugar. Sugar has, um, added sugars has been shown to be not great for our brain or for the rest of our body. That um, that being said, you know, I don't like telling people you have to cut out all sugar because that sets us up for failure. So using a little bit of honey or something in something that you you are making is better than um, giving up and going out and just binging on ice cream or something. So everything in moderation, in my opinion, um, you know that less than teaspoon of, of honey that I put into my dressing, if that makes this more appealing to me and I'm able to eat my vegetables and eat my whole grains because of that, then the trade-off is worth it, okay? Um, you know, we do wanna avoid added sugars as much as we can in processed foods and in other things too. All right. Um, so that is my, my bowl here. And um, I will be eating that for lunch. It's just about noon here. And that will be that will be my lunch. So most of this stuff you can pre prep. Again, you could put most of this stuff in a bowl in the morning and put eggs on top of it if you want, or you could just use those lentils and put some eggs on, or you could use the quinoa, or you could just mix all those veggies into a pan and put some eggs on top of that if you like it. You can also um, turn your quinoa into like kind of like an oatmeal type um, mixture. And if you want for dinner, you could put salmon, you could put um, other thing, other protein sources on top of this, tofu, those types of things and make it your own. So that is um, the recipe. I'm just making sure that I used up everything that I had out. I think I did. Avocados are great too, um, if you can get them. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful to you guys. And um, I think I got through it. <laughs> great, that was, that was really, really great. Um, I have a question for you yeah. myself. So you mentioned sugar, you mentioned honey. Um, what about other sugar alternatives like Splenda, um, monk fruit, um, agave? What about those types? Are, are there some that are better than others? Yeah, that's a good question. So in general, honey, maple syrup, sugar, all of those things our body recognizes as sugar, right? So sugar is sugar is sugar, right? So just because somebody says, uh, like, honey is not necessarily better than, than um, white sugar for your body. It's it's all the same. The sugar alternatives, um, in my opinion, you know, the the evidence for those are really what we don't want to be doing is increasing our body's wanting kind of craving of sugar. And by putting those things in, um, we're we're just kind of doing that. So 
if you can use more natural sugars like fruit, you know, if you're craving sugar, having something with fruit is better. Agave is going to be um, metabolized the same way as honey and maple syrup. Um, I think it's better to have the real sugar, but very little of it than to have a ton of things that are sweet with those sugar alternatives in it. You know, like soda, we don't keep soda in my house. My, I have an 11 year old whose friends all have soda or whatever. And so he wants soda. So, you know, my house, we don't drink diet soda. If he wants a soda, he gets like a soda once a month and he knows it's a treat, you know, and it's the real thing with the sugar in it. You know, yeah. not my favorite, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. When you're talking about having it in your diet increases a craving for the sugars, would you say the same thing for salts? Yeah, definitely. It definitely takes us some time to get used to all of those things. That's why, you know, cutting things off like cold turkey is really, really hard for most people and doesn't work. And that's why I don't recommend it, you know, um, because then all of a sudden, oh, I've gone a week and oh my gosh, I just need like the chips or whatever. And then, then I eat the whole bag, you know, and it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, and, and we kind of give up. So it's, it, it's, Everything in moderation, slowly taking these things out, slowly reducing the amount of sodium you're eating. And actually, if you're reducing your ultra processed food intake, you will re reduce your sodium intake dramatically. You won't even realize it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Prezant. That was certainly really informative and a lot of fun too. I hope that everyone here today has been inspired to evaluate their own nutrition choices and consider incorporating the concept of food as medicine into their own meal preparations. If anyone has unanswered questions or wants to contact Parkinson Canada's information and referral team after the webinar, they can be reached at 1-888-664-1974 or support at parkinson.ca. Of course, that's also going to be included in the email that we'll be sending out. So watch your email inboxes for the follow-up email that will include a link to recording of this webinar, the full recipe for creating your own custom savory bowls at home, and links to the other resources mentioned today. And we'll also include Dr. Prezant's website and contact information for Parkinson Canada's information and referral team. I hope you'll join us at our next webinar, Parkinson's Awareness Month, a story of empowerment through music, taking place on Wednesday, April 17th. Watch your email inboxes in early April for our e-newsletter, which will include more information about the webinar and the registration link. On behalf of all of us at Parkinson Canada, I'd like to thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.